to process your documentation, which we'll learn uh, a bit more from um, in a little bit um, uh, from Ani Akan. Um, again, we have several mortgage partners uh, on the platform, such as FCM Bank UK. And the aim is, is that, you know, Sesso is really trying to kickstart the mortgage market by having this pre-verification. We can have a seamless process from the Sesso platform and, 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 and clients who are interested in buying and right in through the mortgage bank. So the process can be easily defined and go through uh, seamlessly. And we're working, you know, um, you know, every day to, to improve this process. And we're going to hear more, um, you know, from Sella about, you know, the great work that they're doing to introduce more products into the market. Um, so once you, you, uh, you, um, you do a service on the account, you can make an account on Sesso where you can record all of your transactions. Uh, you can look at your, your history, um, your upcoming tours and manage your properties to make sure that it's a seamless process between then the buyer and then the acquisition. Um, of, of the property. Um, so why are we here? Um, you know, Sesso is building, as we said, a one-stop shop for property transaction. So people can come to the site, uh, you be, um, you know, uh, ensure that the property is legitimate, the property is real, and the property is bankable. We really want to solve the issue of trust and also, uh, you know, build a seamless, uh, you know, route from the diaspora uh, into investing in property uh, in uh, Nigeria. Um, and then we'll be scaling out soon to Ghana um, and beyond. Um, so, so that's um, um, the, the, the key uh, aspect uh, on the intro to SESO. So now we're gonna go into um, our, um, our panel discussion and get a few questions and intros in from, uh, from our speakers. So really, uh, to kick it off, uh, uh, Dr. Nevin, um, Andrew, we were wondering if you could uh, give an intro um, about where does Nigeria stand right now, kind of on, on the macroeconomic uh, outlook, especially uh, on the property uh, um, um, in, in, uh, in specific. Uh, maybe you know to touch before COVID, how things were looking and where you see uh, the opportunities. Oh, I, I think your, your your sound is not on. You have to click on the. Is the, is the sound up now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. They reversed on this technology. We're all learning so many different technologies to uh, interact, and it's just a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me speak for perhaps five minutes or so, just on the macroeconomic situation. For those who don't know me, I'm the uh, one of my roles as chief economist of PwC Nigeria, and I've been in Nigeria for uh, over a decade, and I own my own house and paid off my mortgage, thankfully. Um, let me start by saying at the outset, I don't really have any good news at the moment about the macroeconomic situation. So for those who are based in Europe, you might have seen this morning um, that the uh, Eurozone announced that they expect a contraction of 7.5% um, in the economy in 2020, which is just uh, obviously a bigger economic shock than anything we've ever had in our, our lifetime. But the U.S. economy shrank by 5% in the first quarter annualized, the UK, UK economy similarly. Uh, Australia is expecting 10% shrinkage in um, the first half of the year, a country that's never had a recession. In terms of Africa and Nigeria, the World Bank, and these numbers are always behind, is expecting a shrinkage of 1.6%, almost 2%. Population is growing at 3%, which means per capita income would decline by 5%. And of course, we've already had declining per capita income every year for five years oh, in, in, uh, uh, in Nigeria. Andrew, sorry, I, people are saying, I, I'm seeing in the chat, people are saying they can't. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Someone messaged, I couldn't, I couldn't hear, but now they can't hear. Okay, let's continue. Sorry. So I think we're in a very difficult situation, but it's compounded in Nigeria by the, um, and sorry, I'm looking away, I'm just getting some notes here. It's compounded by the fact that Nigeria is an oil economy. Oil is the second largest uh, earner of FX. I say the second largest because, of course, the largest earner of FX is the diaspora. I know we have many members of the diaspora here. We wrote the paper last year saying that, in fact, the biggest export of Nigeria are people, not oil. But the oil does have an impact. So last night there was a session with the Minister of State for uh, finance, budget, and planning. And let me give you a couple of numbers here um, that are coming from the government. So the government's expecting GDP to contract by 3.5%. 
oil earnings to to drop from 5.5 trillion going to the federation account to 1.1 trillion so that's an 80 percent reduction in that essentially a collapse in oil revenues um they're gonna customs revenue is gonna decline vat's gonna decline the total decline projected for the government is 8.6 from 8.6 trillion i'm sorry for going quickly i know we're pressed for time 8.6 trillion naira in uh, federation account revenue to 3.9 so a severe uh, fiscal shock to Nigeria, and the country is now coming to grips with that. I think that what we're going to see, and I'll end on this, though, is we, or already started to see, is this fiscal shock is going to force um, some radical restructuring in Nigeria. So even in the short few weeks that this crisis has been going on, we've had the fuel subsidy removed, we've had the currency devalued and a narrowing of the windows on it. Uh, we've had co comments about the power sector, and the Governor El Rufai's committee is working on that, likely to see radical restructuring of the power. We also had something, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, the, the uh, committee that was formed in 2013 to look at the restructuring of the NDAs of the federal government, the uh, Oren Shea committee, the president two days ago ratified that. So in a short space of time, we've started to see some real restructuring actions on behalf of that which are we're really effectively forced on the real estate industry let me just say pwc has been very clear for four or five years that real estate's the most important sector everyone needs a place to live uh, obviously the diaspora is very interested in the sector we applaud sesa global's the um, attempts to try to give some structure to it so people could invest safely in it. As I said, I own a house in Lucky and uh, you know, it was not an easy process to buy, not an easy process to uh, um, uh, get a mortgage for it at 21%. But to the extent that we can start to put in place the legislative framework and the types of things SESA Global is doing, the real estate um, industry is ultimately going to really boom in, in Nigeria. So again, let me stop there given our limited time, but I, I have no, no real good news on the economy except for the fact that it's forcing restructuring in Nigeria. Yeah, which is definitely, you know, uh, key in that regard. Um, so kind of looking then on, on, the, on, the, on the, um, the opportunity of new types of financing coming into Nigeria, um, Stella, we wanted to move to you to maybe give some insight on some of the products that FCMB UK uh, offers and is focusing on. Okay. Um, th thanks for the opportunity, Daniel. Um, I find that a lot of my speaking, I'll be talking about statistics in Nigeria. To be honest, I couldn't hear Nevin, but we really should be speaking about the same figures. Um, so I am Nigerian, but I live and work um, in, in, in London. But my heart remains um, in Africa and specifically Nigeria. Um, at the time, as far back as 2017, um, there was talk about a housing deficit in Nigeria. And the figure that was banded at the time was 17 million. Now, it's a long time since, sorry, that was 2007. It's a long time since, since then. So I'd imagine, of course, that the housing deficit, you know, has increased. Um, in Nigeria, it's, it's recognized that about um, 15 million Nigerians are actually in the diaspora, which is 7.5% of the population. Now, because Nigeria has such a huge population, um, a lot of that are, are youth, um, about 46% of the Nigerian population are youth. And because it's a growing economy still, there's lots of gaps, there's lots of rooms for infrastructure, healthcare, education. And so we can find that there's an increased influx of finance into Africa. Now, the question I ask, if the rest of the world is interested in Africa, there is, or Nigeria to be specific, there is no reason why Nigerians in the diaspora should not be. Now, bringing it home to the issue of mortgage financing, I think more than any other time, th this COVID-19 situation has brought to fore what are the real essential things in life. And before now, I would say food, clothing, and shelter. And even as a woman, I'm saying, sorry, clothing has to take a back seat. So it's really about shelter and food. Now, as more people are looking into, into Africa and Nigeria, which is arguably the largest economy, there's the issue of how can I finance the purchase? How do I, how can I help to close the gap? So the opportunity exists either as an investor looking to help towards closing the gap um, in the housing in market, or as an individual, as we begin to take more interest in, in the motherland, if you will, um, how can I have a piece of Nigeria without giving up my UK residence, which is where FCMB Bank UK comes in. 
because we, we operate in a peculiar space. We're a niche bank. We are a UK bank regulated by the UK authorities, but our focus is Africa. Our focus is Africa businesses, Africa entrepreneurs, Africa based and focused um, businesses and, and individuals. So bearing that in mind, we are happy to provide to Nigerians in the diaspora, starting with the UK to begin with, with loans to enable them buy property in Nigeria. Um, these loans um, would go up to 15 years, that's the maximum tenor. You, you don't have to wait out the entire 15 years that so you can prepay um, without penalty because we want to incentivize people to, to make those investments. And more importantly, because I find the beauty I find in, in this CESO global ecosystem, if you will, it addresses the concerns of that anybody would have. Buying a property either to reside in or an investment is the single largest purchase you would make. Now, it's not the kind of decision you want to make on your own. So there's issues about the quality of the home, the legitimacy of the, of the property, which Anyaka will speak about. But the third angle is the affordability, which is where FCMB Bank UK comes in. We're happy to provide funding to Nigerians in the diaspora to buy property in those locations, Lagos, Abuja, based on the fact that you may have secondary property here. Now, secondary property here, that means it's not your home, but you enjoy rental income from that. So we're basically looking at the income streams in the UK verified and taking a view on that to provide you lending um, to buy homes in, in Nigeria. Um, sadly, I imagine um, um, Andrew would have spoken about that. There's a devaluation of the Naira. And so it means that the diaspora do have increased power. Um, I, I get emails every day from developers looking to sell property. I got one two days ago from a developer selling property in the Chevron area of, of Lecky for 85 million Naira and did the math, that's about 170,000 pounds. So we are happy to provide you up to 65% of that cost for you to pay over a maximum period of 15 years at an interest rate that would make sense to you. Um, our current rate is 5.75%, which is a 5.65% margin above the Bank of England base rate of 0.1. So it is flexible. As the rate goes down, it would re reduce further. And we're able to provide you those funding up to 15 years for you to buy those properties. But this, the unique proposition, in addition to our financing, is that you're operating within an ecosystem which gives you the assurances of security, assurances of the quality of the home, and, and it is a partnership that works. Um, I, I like to say to people, if the rest of the world is paying attention to Africa now, there is no reason why we Africans should not do so. And now is the time. I, I can't think of a better time. Hey, that's great. Uh, thanks so much, Stella. Um, you know, uh, you know, great points. And I think this goes along with the opportunity being now really, you know, to buy and to invest. Um, one question often people have who have never bought into Nigeria is uh, you know, the legal framework and how to buy a property. Um, uh, Aniaka, I want to see if uh, could you take us through, uh, you know, that aspect, kind of the legal framework and what kind of the services you think are, are most key. All right. Thank, thank you, Andrew. And good to be on this platform. Very good initiative. Look, I, I think that my, my, my brief summary of the legal framework for buying property in Nigeria is really going to be focused on the subject of this webinar, which is really targeted at buyers in the diaspora. And so that would be my pitch. And so there are various federal laws and state laws that govern and regulate the ownership, use, alienation, and transfer of real estate in Nigeria. But like I said earlier, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to I'll be focusing on just three of those laws. The Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Clan Use Act, and the Instrument Registration Law of the respective states of Nigeria. Now, the Constitution guarantees that the right of every citizen of Nigeria to own and acquire real property in any part of the country. However, like any other right, this right to own and own real estate is, sub is not absolute and is subject to certain restrictions. Now, this brings me to the Land Use Act, which applies, like I said earlier, to the whole of Nigeria. The Land Use Act, which was enacted in 1978, radically changed the land tenure system in Nigeria and the system of ownership in Nigeria. The Act vests all land comprised in the territory of each state in Nigeria, excluding land held by the federal government, 
in the governor of that state who owns the land in trust and administers it for the use and common benefit of all Nigerians. So in effect, it gives the governor of the state the free old title to land in the state. A fundamental change introduced by the Land Use Act is that title or ownership to real property in Nigeria is neither absolute nor perpetual in nature. So what does that mean? So this gives the governor the power to grant a statutory right of occupancy for a defined period of time in respect of land or property in a state. The statutory right of occupancy grants to persons seeking to hold property in land the right to the use and occupation of the land or the property. So in effect, effectively, this is a leasehold interest. I should at this point mention that any person that to, in whom land was duly vested prior to the commencement of the Land Use Act, and that is prior to March 28, 1978, is entitled to continue to own and retain possession of the land under a deemed right of occupancy. So for commercial real estate development, whether for residential or for offices, a statutory right of occupancy is generally granted for a period of 99 years, which period is generally renewable on expiration. So title to real property in Nigeria, therefore, is usually construed in terms of a right of occupancy. And it is evident by the issuance of a document known as the certificate of occupancy. And the extent to which real property can be owned or mortgage in Nigeria is dependent on the tenor of the right of occupancy held. So therefore, when we speak of the purchase of real property in Nigeria, we are therefore speaking of the grant or the assignment of a right of occupancy. When we speak of leasing or renting property, we are in fact speaking of a sublease of that property. And when we speak of mortgaging property, we are referring to a mortgage of the right of occupancy held by the owner of the property. What all this means is that the right of every Nigerian to own real property in any part of the country is therefore subject to the interests of the governor. And under the Land Use Act, in order to transfer title to real property, whether by way of an assignment, a mortgage, a sublease, or otherwise, it is necessary to seek and obtain the consent of the governor of the particular state in which the real property is located. Title to property purchased or mortgage cannot vest in a purchaser or mortgagee until and unless the consent of the governor is obtained. And that is key. Without the consent of the governor of the particular state, you cannot legitimately and legally and lawfully transfer ownership to a purchaser. And I must add that such consent will usually be endorsed on the document seeking to transfer title. Seeing that I have just a little, a few minutes to wrap this up, this brings me to the last piece of legislation I would like to talk about as part of the legal framework. The instrument registration law enacted by each of the states and which regulates the registration of title and instrument or interest, interest affecting real property at the land registry of the state. So once the governor's consent has been obtained to the sale of real property, the document of transfer of title has to be registered at the land registry. Registration at the land registry completes the process of purchase and transfer of title or ownership to real property. And registration does essentially three things. First, it gives notice, it gives notice to the public of the order of title to the property. Therefore, any subsequent transaction in relation to that property will be subject to the purchaser's interest. 
Two, it also gives priority over subsequently registered interest or competing interests or claims. And I think that lastly, what it does is that it also affords the purchaser or the title holder the benefit that the document will be admissible in court for purposes of proving title. This, in a nutshell, sets out the legal framework that governs this, the purchase, the sale and purchase of real property in Nigeria. Obviously, there are many other laws, but like I said, we this purpose, this discussion is focused principally on the on on, on purchase of property and focus on uh, diasporas that may want to acquire property in Nigeria. Now, when you go into the process, the professionals that you that you would engage to look at this process for you would take you through some of the other administrative and procedural uh, requirements that are needed. But, but essentially, this is just the broad legal framework for the purchase of property in Nigeria. Fantastic. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll, we'll move on to uh, the next round of questions. And again, Everyone, please continue to ask questions uh, into the chat group. We're seeing people ask, ask questions, which is fantastic. Uh, our moderator is going through, and we'll get to those uh, in just 15 minutes. Um, so next question to our panel, um, uh, this one is to you, uh, Andrew, um, is that can you give us some insights uh, on what, uh, in your opinion, what we expect uh, on the outcomes of COVID-19 on the market? And just want to maybe one uh, thought is that could there be an argument that potentially Nigeria is less exposed since a uh, majority of the property developers do not take debt when doing their, um, their building construction compared to the UK, Canada? Oh, I, I think... I think it's on mute. Yeah. I think you're so on mute. Oh, no, no, I can't hear you. No. Um, okay, um, Doc, we'll come back to you uh, in the next question. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just we'll pause on that question um, and come back. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, um, so this one is uh, to you, Stella. Um, so the recent increase in strength of uh, the British pound to Naira and you know USD, um, et cetera, um, has presented an opportunity to Nigerians and the diaspora to buy at a better uh, rate. Do you expect uh, a growth in the real estate investment from diaspora? And how can both diaspora take advantage of the new strength of foreign currency? And that also for local developers, how they can you know price this into their strategy? Okay. Um, because I'm Nigerian, I always speak about the issue of the depreciation of the Naira with, 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 uh, with some element of emotions because it's not a good thing to happen, but it has happened. Um, and the simple answer is yes. Uh, with the depreciation of the value of the Naira, effectively you're able to afford more to buy in Nigeria. Um, there, there was a time when the, the pound to, to, to the Naira was about 250 now, in today's terms, you could buy twice the number of properties you could back then. So, yes, it is the reality on ground. And I, I think what it is, is that I, I would like to speak about the issue of demand, you know, and the growth of real estate, and which was posed to Andrew. For me, I look at it as a commodity. And commodities, um, the, the, the growth of any industry is driven by the demand and supply. And so, so long as the population continues to increase, and so long as the housing deficits are not met, there will always be room for growth um, in that sector. Um, you are correct, who, whoever asked that question, that a lot of the developers may not have had access to funding, but regardless, because there is such a huge gap to fill, there will always um, be need um, for, for properties. And so what, what, is the, what is the specific um, opportunity? So perhaps one of the people on the call is a developer. Um, while Nigeria may be going through some form of financial stress um, and you've had the depreciation of the Naira, you do as a developer have another segment of Nigerians abroad 
who can still afford to buy those properties. So I think so long as this, this interest in Africa and specifically Nigeria is not going to wane, if anything else, it will increase. So what it does, it just opens up the market for developers. Um, the issue, however, I, I would point out is that as these developers have access to global markets through Nigerians in the diaspora buying, the issue of quality is key. And so which is why also, so it works both ways. At the end of the day, the, the quality of homes increases. Those in the diaspora take comfort in the fact that they're not buying into these properties blindly. And so the quality is assured. So there are opportunities both ways, both for the developers and for the people in the diaspora to, to, um, to, to take advantage of this opportunity, which to be honest, I only see going up, you know, for now. I hope I've answered the question. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, excellent. And then maybe we'll go back to Andrew. Can we check? Is your sound working? Uh, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. So sorry about that. We all yeah, understand perfect. the technology. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, so I, I, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, I think as Stella said, I mean, and, and back to the question that, that you asked me is Nigeria is in a, in a difficult as the situation is the fact that um, debt levels for individuals and debt levels for developers are lower things are being financed by equity makes them more or sorry less risk with a with a shock on that so that's one positive and i think stella's kind of captured it i mean if we look at the fundamentals of this lagos is supposed to become the world's largest uh, city in the world this century um, and of course, the population of Nigeria continues to grow very rapidly. So you now have prime, prime property, which by world standards is vastly undervalued. What is going to really drive real estate values, as you've seen around the world, it doesn't matter whether it's Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila, um, uh, Rio de Janeiro, is when you get the combination of rising incomes and growing population, it puts pressure on on property prices and um, so if we can come out of this and we are growing faster six to eight percent um, growth is what we've always said if you have that growth going on the constraints of the land situation in Lagos you're definitely going to see property appreciation fantastic um, yeah, thank you for that uh, feedback a um, couple questions now going to um, what, what has been asked from uh, our, our attendant attendees Daniel, um, now we've lost you Oh, now he lost me. Okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So going to a couple of questions from our um, from our audience um, is um, um, so to Ani uh, So um, someone was asked: enforce enforceability of laws remain a challenge in Nigeria. How can this be mitigated, especially for diaspora buyers? And can you maybe touch on maybe some things that maybe the the um, the legal industry would like to see, where the government could also, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, make the process better and more more simple. Look, uh, Daniel, thanks a lot. Look, buying property in Nigeria can be complex. I mean, that's that, that, that's a statement of the obvious, and I, and it has its associated risk. I mean, I'm, I know that. Some of those in the diaspora have had terrible experience with buying property in Nigeria. One has heard uh, of potential buyers sending funds to family members or friends without such funds being used for the purposes intended. Uh, notwithstanding this risk, and like Stella and Navila said, look, real property still remains a viable area of investment in Nigeria, especially in the countries, uh, major commercial areas of Lagos and Abuja. So my take is that instead of avoiding buying property because of the risk, and maybe because of you know previous experience or past experience, what potential purchasers should be trying to do is to mitigate those risks by protecting it uh, themselves adequately. First thing first for me, and this, it goes to the question of ensuring trust and building confidence in the process, in the purchase process. I think it's a given. And it's something that I cannot overemphasize. It is important that you engage the services of a repeatable firm of professionals that have experience in the real estate sector. And whether they are estate surveyors and valuers or real estate agents, and you know, you need to you need to go for a repeatable firm and firms that actually have, have, have stood out in the market. 
In terms of law firms, obviously you need to deal with reputable law firms, firms that have experience, firms that have handled transactions and, you know, and, and, and in the sector. If you notice my emphasis is on my emphasis is on reputable integrity and experience. Because as part of the process of buying property, you need a well-grounded law firm to take you through the entire gamut of process involved in purchasing power, in purchasing a property. The firm of solicitors will need to carry out on your behalf thorough investigation of the seller's title to confirm authenticity of the title document, ensure that the seller has good and clean title without any encumbrance, any adverse interest. I mean, they will need to guide you through the complex process of negotiating, drafting and preparing the transaction document and also completing the sale and ultimately registering the purchaser's title. I mean, that process is what we typically refer to as uh, perfection. And that perfection, like I mentioned, a part of the legal framework comes after you've obtained governor's consent and you seek to register the, the title at the land's registry. Um, okay. Yeah. But I, 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 I would also just want to add a thing that goes to Daniel, if I may, on the process of integrity and trust in the system. What I've also seen buyers do, because it, the buying of property involves multiple steps. I have seen a growing trend of using escrow arrangements. Escrow arrangements allow parties to, to, to appoint a neutral third party to hold the purchase price and the transaction documents and to only release those, the purchase price and the transaction document to the seller and purchaser respectively when certain terms of the, of, the, of, 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 of the transaction has been met and complied with. That I think also adds trust to the, to the process of the purchase of purchasing property in Nigeria. I'm not sure if that has addressed the issue that we yeah, raised yeah, yeah. in terms of confidence and integrity of the process. Okay, thank you. I think um, a, a couple of questions have been flying in on. I think people are really excited in the mortgage opportunity and want to learn more. So maybe just to ask a few of those that have come in. So a question has been asked, can a Nigerian living in the UK but doesn't have his green card yet, uh, would they be eligible for this mortgage loan? Okay, so because it's a bit noisy. So a Nigerian living in the UK but doesn't have a green card. The green card is applicable to America, I believe. Yeah. No, the I, person is, does the person need to have a Nigerian passport? Yeah, they don't um, have a Nigerian passport, I think is what they're saying. Yes, okay. No, they don't have to have a Nigerian passport. And I'll explain the way it works again. So you've decided to buy this property in, the, in Nigeria. As of today, if you have any property other than the one you live in, that's your investment property, okay? FCMB Bank UK, so regardless, you don't have to have a Nigerian passport. You're a legitimate um, resident of the UK. You have an existing property. Even if there is some existing loan on that, what FCMB Bank would do, would do a valuation of your investment property and will be happy to give you up to 65% of the value of that property to buy a property of your choice in Nigeria. So nothing to do with your, your, your having a Nigerian passport. We're looking at your revenue streams from the UK, from the rental property um, you, you own. Now I understand some people said, maybe I was a bit faster. I'll just go over the terms again. So the, the tenor for the loans we are giving, the maximum tenor is 15. So meaning you could actually have it for less. Bearing in mind that compared to properties in the UK, you're probably looking at property, uh, a loan of 170 to 200,000 um, pounds. Now, 15 years is a long time. You don't have to, but if that's what you want, fine. What we do is we match the rental income you get on your investment property. And that essentially is how you're servicing the loan you took from us to buy property in Nigeria. Now, as is often the case, a person would have an existing mortgage. So let us say the property is 
for ease of illustration, property is worth a million pounds. You have an existing outstanding loan of 350,000 on it. Now, technically, we could give you up to 650,000, 350 of which you would use to pay your existing lender and the balance you can use to buy properties that you require or that you want to buy in Nigeria. Um, I must make a note though to say that even though the tenor goes up to 15 years, um, there is an, a cap of 70 years so someone who is 45 and will have the full benefit of the 15 year tenor um, however if a lender is say 60 it means that they'll be capped at a 10 year tenor so 15 years max the interest rate today is 5.75 which is 5.6 above the bank of england base rate you don't have to have a nigerian passport you just need to be resident in the uk and we can determine your source of income here um, so that's where it is from, from, from the lending standpoint. And of course, we rely on the solicitors to do the due diligence, which gives you the comfort that the money is going to be used to buy a property for which the vendor has um, a legitimate, um, the, the, the owner has, the seller has title to that property. Um, the rate is not fixed. So it is a floating rate. It's 5.65% above the Bank of England base rate. So if the Bank of England base rate goes to zero, then we'll be lending at 5.65. So, so I think a question for that um, came in. Yeah, great, I was just about to ask that. Okay, um, that's fantastic. Um, uh, Andrew, I'm gonna ask, uh, kind of uh, go to you on some questions that have come in. It's maybe a, a few questions, but we're gonna kind of put them into one uh, category. So people uh, would like your perspective on, um, the kind of the, the, the future um, kind of demand and property in Nigeria and what you think kind of in terms of, you know, pricing in the future. Uh, people are making comments that they uh, expect cost of construction to increase with importing. But as you touched uh, before about there should be um, a rising demand and also kind of with that, is there anything from the past recessions like 2008, 2012, that we could look at as kind of an example of how the real estate market would um, um, would react after this. Well, I think it's. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, I mean, I think you know we've been very vocal about this. We've said real estate is the most important sector to dr drive uh, employment and reduce reduce poverty. But from the buyer's perspective, I mean, the the industry has been um, very difficult the last few years. What, why is that? One is, um, as pointed out by my co-panelists, it's just it's just been difficult, right? And you know, we've encouraged the government at the federal level certainly to make it easier um, to to buy and transact properties. And I I think that one of the outcomes of this crisis will be that there'll be movement in that direction. In terms of the economics of it, I mean, I think that. We've had four years of, uh, certainly four years at least, of declining income per capita. So that's put pressure on people's incomes. And so you haven't seen the rise in real estate values that you would expect. If we had a growing economy, just mathematically, the way it works anywhere in the world is the price of real estate is related to income because people calculate what they can afford. Places that are attractive because they're close to the center, like Lucky Phase 1, even as far out as VGC, for example. In uh, Sir Larry's got some areas being redeveloped. Uh, their price, by definition, goes up because it's, it's limited. So from the viewpoint of an investor, they will do well if Lagos and the Nigerian economy do well. Um, and that's what they need to you know, uh, hopefully, hopefully see over the next few years. If incomes remain depressed, real estate prices are gonna may, remain depressed. So there's no question it's been a difficult few years. The question is, is it gonna get turned around on that? Now, in terms of construction costs, I think that one thing that we've said publicly is the way construction construction needs to be appropriate for the climate and the conditions in Nigeria. And I think too many times the architecture, the materials have been adopted that are not actually fit for purpose. So we'd like to see some building that's more appropriate for Nigeria that uses local building materials. Obviously drives up the, you know, counteracts the impact of the depreciation if you are then importing expensive materials. And of course you can't deliver middle class or lower middle class housing using imported materials. But I, I think that one thing that will happen is there'll be better and better construction and there'll be more thinking about local. I was talking to someone, a builder yesterday was talking about the use of wood in this climate rather than cement, for example, um, uh, on that. But, but 
fundamentally, I think and if someone who buys a property, like myself, I own a property, the value of my property will go up if the economy does well. If the economy continues to stagnate, I can't count on capital appreciation. But of course, I live in my house, so I'm not that concerned day by day with capital yeah. appreciation. Okay, great. Uh, that, that's great. Thanks for the perspective um, on that. Um, uh, on the account, we have a few legal questions. Well, Daniel, we need in. you to turn on your microphone again. How about now? Hear me now? There we go. Thank you. Okay. I think I have to double click it. Let me turn on that. But, um, okay, um, there's a few legal questions that have come in um, on the account. We're just going to go through um, a couple of these. Uh, hopefully, we just, let's go through them quickly. The three that have been asked. So, the first one is. Does the owner of the property have to pay ground rent to the governor since the property is owned and sold? Daniel, I, I lost I lost the last bit of it. I, I didn't hear all that. So the um, we have a question that's been asked: If the property is owned, if a property is owned leasehold, does the owner of the property have to pay ground rent to the governor? Okay, now it depends, it depends on the nature of the property. Now, grand rent is, uh, is payable by the occupier of the property. So for, so, so for instance, if you, if, if there's a developer, and the developer has, uh, has, has, has developed a couple of properties which is selling to various customers and depends on the nature in which the title is being transferred. So if the, if the nature of the transfer is by an outright assignment, the purchaser would have to pay the ground rent, which is now called land use charge to the government. However, if it's in a, a block of apartments and the, and the developer returns you know, residual ownership of the property, and what essentially is being done is that it's a long lease, the developer would have the obligation to pay ground rent to the government. But what tends to happen is that because of the language in the in the land use uh, the land the land use uh, land land charge law, it says an occupier. And you tend to find that in most developed uh, developments, the the the, the 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 owners of the individual units tend to contribute proportionately to the amount of the land use charge assessed on the property. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. So the next real question I'll come in is that, is there a statutory period within, a, within which a purchaser must register the land? Now, the, it depends on the state, but yes, each state, like I said, has a, a instrument registration law. So for Lagos State, for instance, once uh, once you're required to register the land within 60 days of obtaining governor's consent. Now, I said earlier that registration is important because it goes to priority and it goes to notice. So you're required to register that. I mean, if you do, if you, if you register beyond 60 days, you can still do that. But what it means that you're going to pay a penalty for late registration. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. And then the, the, the other legal question that I come in from Vincent was, once I purchase the land, what is the process I go through to register it? Okay. Um, okay, in a nutshell, once you purchase the land, look, there, there are processes that involve once you have the agreement, you've closed your transaction, right? You need to apply for governor's consent. That's the first step. When you apply, your lawyers will apply for governor's consent. Once you obtain governor's consent, you, the documents, the, the transfer document needs to be stamped. Stamp duty is payable on is, is a documentary task. So you will pay tax on the on, on the on the on, on the on the transaction document. Once that is done, you seek to register at the land's registry. That completes the process of perfection and you know transfer of title to the to, 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 to the purchaser. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, Stella, we're going to go to you quickly for a uh, couple minutes of rapid fire questions that have come in. A lot of interest mm -hmm. on um, the mortgages. So, um, so uh, you can ask Stella, are the mortgages amortized or interest only? Okay, um, so um, 
there, there are quite a few questions that have come in, so I'll, I'll try, try to answer them all in one go. Okay, um, the mortgage could be a repayment mortgage, in which case you're paying the principal and interest, or it could be interest only. The difference, however, is that if it is an interest only mortgage, we would only be able to give you up to 60% of the value of the security property in the UK, in London, and the maximum tenor will be three years. So, so you, you can have it interest only, but we'll be looking at a 60% as opposed to 65% loan to value with a tenor of three years. I, I noticed that some questions have come in as regards, uh, so what if you don't have a UK um, secondary property, how, how can you benefit from the scheme? Um, what it is, we are implementing this, we have a, a phased approach. Um, so the current phase is really where we are taking the benefit of the security property in London and that is phase one. Now we have about 140 people on this call, excluding the panelists, that is. And so that what that tells us is that you have, you have more than just a passing interest in buying property in Nigeria. And the bank being proactive, we are currently working on expanding this proposition. Now, because we have the benefit of your interest, when once that is in place, you will be the first to know. Now, that later variant of the proposition will not restrict um, the borrowing to people who have secondary property in the UK. So that will address the questions of what if I'm a German resident, what if I'm a Canadian investor. So that is a phase two um, implementation, which we will let you know about um, um, not, not, not too long from now. So for now, it's UK properties. Um, you can be interest only or repayment. And there was a question as regards the repossession. So we are a subsidiary of First City Monument Bank in Nigeria, but we are a UK bank. So we are regulated by the UK financial authorities. So the question as regards whether it's the UK repossession um, laws that will guide this lending, the, the simple answer is yes. Now, I would like to believe for, for someone who is resident in the UK, that should provide you some element um, of comfort. Um, if there are any other questions and we have the time, I'll be, I'll be happy to take them. Great. Just to give you a yes or no on this, people have asked a few times, can you use that uh, loan to buy a property in other areas, Calabar, Ibadan, Abeokuta? The, the simple answer is yes. I'll explain to you why. Because really what we've done, we're taking um, the risk of the value of your property in the UK. Now, we, we're just proposed, so we're giving you a secured loan. Um, it's just that because of the amounts in question, you're not likely to use that money to go on a holiday or trip around the world, but it, it is available for you to buy in any other location um, because the security asset for us is the UK. Um, I will, however, subscribe as a responsible lender that when you do take those loans, even if you're buying property outside of Lagos or Abuja, you do the due diligence from the legal side, especially and the quality of homes, which Anirkan has expounded in great detail. Um, so it's not just having the money, but the whole benefit of what we're proposing is an ecosystem where you can have the benefit of the money, but before you go to buy that property in Calabar, ensure that the, the seller has legitimate title to it. Because that is of great concern to us also as a responsible lender. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so this is coming to the end of the panel. I thought maybe um, each of our panelists uh, want to give you know, one minute on you know one thing that you know excites you and keeps you optimistic about you know uh, the property market and uh, opportunities into the future. Well, let me let me start. As I said, I mean I think that uh, despite all the challenges we've had, certainly the decade that I've lived in in Nigeria economically. Um, you know, I think it's a bright future. I bought a home there. Lagos is going to become the world's largest city, the center of Africa. And I, I think that uh, and we also want to see uh, uh, commercial centers, industrial centers around the country in every. So in Enugu, in uh, Edo State, in Sokoto, in Niger, uh, in Ka Cross River. So, I mean, I think the future is, is bright. And uh, I think that this, if there's any silver lining to this crisis, I think we're seeing some changes to the economic management that are going to allow Nigeria to, to lift off. Fantastic. Uh, Stella? Oh, muted, I think. 
You're muted. I, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think Stella is muted. Oh, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Maybe. Let me turn it. Sorry, maybe. Hey, hey, Aniakan, maybe you go for your closing word and we'll come back to you. Look, let me just pick up from what uh, Nevis, you know, uh, uh, ended his uh, commentary. Look, I think that the impact of COVID-19 uh, is going to bring about a new reality. One, one standout trend is that there's acceleration for di of digital transformation. Uh, we have e-commerce having becoming the default for consumers. Businesses are having to shift to mass home working, executing transactions using electronic platforms. And you know, when you look at certain sectors uh, in the country, you look at even the most conservative of those sectors, which is my which is my 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 area. Look at the courts. There's a greater push for conducting trials remotely. Now, what I, what I see, and this is the exciting part of it, what I see post COVID nineteen. Uh, is that I, was, I think that there will be pressure on the state government to fully automate the records of the land registry. So that it makes it possible to, you know, actually conduct searches, do title investigation, and perhaps file documents, you know, remotely online, right? I am aware that currently Lagos state government do have uh, a, a platform where you can do electronic searches to the Lagos information management system. And similar applies in Abuja to the Abuja geographic information system. However, you need to visit the lands registry to do that. So I'm hoping that as part of the digital transformation, which is a part of the positive impact of the COVID-19, we will get to a point where that entire process of uh, purchase of land, registration and processing can be fully automated. That excites me, and I think it will make it, it will make the process much easier and faster. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, I guess unless uh, Usawa will, will chime in if she comes back, but uh, on my end, I just want to add, uh, you know, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. We'll be sending um, the recording of this and as well as a document on the buying process in Nigeria. Um, one thing I would just say from the SESCO perspective that excites us is that you know, there's really great solutions being launched and this is just the start. So quite people asking the questions on buying property, uh, getting a mortgage if you don't have a property or in other countries like US, Dubai, Canada, you know, we're confident these solutions are, are, are coming and this is really just the start. Um, and, you know, we're going to see um, a lot more innovation and I think more solutions for capital. And we'll just add that, um, you know, uh, these type of features, connecting to lawyers, connecting to banks is, is, is on the, the CESO app and, and website. So we invite people to, uh, to, to, to sign up and, uh, and be a part. Um, we, we'll go, uh, Stella, um, we should rearrange order, but we'll go back uh, to you. Yeah, so um, I was saying that I'm very excited about the youthful pop the youth population in Nigeria. So that really portends demand in the long term. I'm particularly excited about the increasing interest in Africa and not just Africa, specifically Nigeria. So, so to be honest, the only way is up. And as we have more people of the diaspora play, even in the Nigerian property market, I expect to see the quality of the homes um, improve. So those are the things that excite me the most. Um, and which is why FCMB Bank is, is happy to be a bank which is really focused on, on, on Africa and Nigeria precisely. And we'll be taking this conversation further. So as I said, this is just the first phase of the implementation. And we are happy to we're look, work out ex extending the proposition so that more people can take advantage of this opportunity. Excellent. Um, so once again, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. It's such a pleasure. Uh, it was great you know, working with uh, you all. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Keep, um, you know, we'll be sending out information after this. And this is just the first, uh, but we want to do a series of panels. So set the date. And thank you, everyone, so much. So, so glad I would do this. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Good to be on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.